Good morning. Am I on? Okay. Our scripture reading for today is 1 Samuel 7, 12, and 13. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here with us this day, and thank you for your help that is uh, available at all times. And Lord, just be with me this day as I bring this message. May it be your words that I speak, and may those in the congregation here uh, take them to heart and accept them in the manner they are intended. And be with me in Jesus' name. Amen. I didn't expect to be here again this week, <laughs> but uh, Wednesday night, Alan called, called us up on the phone and uh, said they were having, they'd had difficulties uh, on the road to, to uh, Florida. They had busted rims on two of them. Then they, some kind of sensor went bad in their truck as well, so it put them behind quite a bit. So he asked me if I would preach, and I, and I said, oh, last week it didn't go so good. I've been suffering from vertigo so bad that there are times I can't hardly stand up, and last week was that way. So I said, not so well. He said, okay. But then I got to thinking, you know, I made a commitment to preach any time I was asked, so Vicki called him back and said I'd preach, so here I am today. I better put my glasses on. Well, I was sitting here this morning thinking, you know, how God does help. Vicki and I attended a Baptist church in Moscow when I was in college down there. And the main reason we went to the Baptist church was the preacher they had there. He was a man named Mike Brzezinski. He was a Vietnam era Green Beret. And one of the one of the most elite of the Green Bray. He was attached to a special attachment. But he had just one kidney stone after another. He passed like thirty seven kidney stones and he was just in terrible pain. And he would be he sat on a chair beside the pulpit while other people read the scripture and and uh, and gave the announcements. But he'd get up his face would be just, just pale. He'd get up behind the pulpit, and the minute he started preaching, the color would come back in his face. So, God does help. In Samuel 7, 12, 13, Samuel spoke the words, Thus far the Lord has helped us. In the Hebrew, that word, help, the verb form is azar, and the name Ebenezer is a combination of two words, Eben, Azar. It's the rock of help. Well, the verb form of that is literally to protect or to aid. To really understand what <laughs> to really understand what Samuel meant by thus far the Lord, Lord has helped us, you got to turn back to uh, the book of Joshua. And I got it here somewhere. 
Joshua 24, 14. Now thereafter, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river, and in Egypt, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were in the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt for the house from the house of bondage who did this great, those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way we went among the people as through whom we passed. God presumed them. And the people of, of Joshua's day, the rest of that generation, did serve the Lord. But that changed when Joshua died. And the book of Judges uh, covers that period, time period of 410 years, and there were 15 different judges. And during that time, the people had lapsed back into idolatry and idol worship seven times. And uh, Judges says, the people, <laughs> the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Now Samuel is considered the, the last of the judges, but he was also a, a, a prophet. And he's one of the first prophets that actually spoke to the people the words God had spoken to him. But during his time, the, the Israelites had turned again from uh, worshiping the Lord and were serving false idols again, and they went again into bondage to the Philistines. And the Philistines, or the Israelis, got tired of being in bondage, so they were going to fight their way out of it. They were going to try to free themselves. Well, they did this on their own accord. You know, they tried to do it without God. So they sent up a camp at, at Ebenezer. There's a town named Ebenezer as well. Ebenezer is used three times in, in the Bible, yeah. and the only place is Samuel, and it's used three times. Twice for a place and twice for the rock that's set up. But uh, the first time they tried, they went out against the Philistines and lost the battle and lost 4,000 4, men in the battle. So they went back and, and thought, well, if we have the Ark of the Covenant with us, we'll be successful in battle. So they went to Shiloh and, and took the Ark with them, lost the second battle, and the Philistines took the Ark. So the Philistines took the Ark to the town of Ashdod where the temple of Dagon was, and they put the <coughs> ark in the in the temple, you know, and the, went back in the morning, and the statue of, of Dagon had fell over, and it was uh, on the ground, face down, right in front of the ark. So the people of Ashdod thought it must have been an earthquake or something. They put the statue back up. And the next day they went out, and it was on his face again, and the head was busted off, and the hands busted off, and it was outside of the temple. So, but not only was the statue destroyed, but the uh, the people were stricken with tumors. And if you look in the in the King James version, the word used there is emeralds. Well. I looked up that in the in the Hebrew, and the Hebrew word is tahar, tahar, and it literally 
in the Septuagint translation, the first translation from Hebrew to, to Greek, the word is hemorrhoides, hemorrhoids. So the tumors that they had were hemorrhoids. So, so the people of Ashdod want to get rid of the, the ark, so they take it to Gath. Well, people of Gath are smitten with the with emeralds as well. So they send the ark to Ekron. Same type of thing takes place in Ekron. So the Philistines decided we better get rid of the ark because it's, it's going to ruin us. So they took it to Beth Shemesh. And this, this is interesting. Beth Shemesh literally means house of the rising sun. And that's an old song in the 60s. It talks about a, a young man that is um, leaving a very sinful life and he's, he is uh, stuck in the house of the rising sun. Now, if you ever watch the movie um, The Jesus Revolution that comes out, it's about Chuck Smith and, and Greg Laurie and, and uh, in Delaney Frisbee. But in that movie, this young man, Greg Laurie, is deep into use, using drugs, and he's to a point in his life that, that uh, he knows he's deep in sin. Well, the words of the song said, Mothers, tell your children not to do what I have done. <clears throat> Spend their life in sin and misery in the house of the rising sun. The people of... Uh, Beth Shemesh received the ark, and the first thing they do is open up and look into it. And 50,070 people died by looking into the ark. So they asked the uh, people of uh, Kiriath Jerem to come and, and get the ark. They, they don't want anything more to do with it. So, they take the ark to the house of Abinadab, uh, and his son Eleazar is commissioned to take care of the ark, and he does. But for 20 years, um, they're still, still living in sin. They have turned back to Baal worship again, and so they're in, uh, in misery. So Samuel, they go to Samuel and ask him to call upon the Lord. And he tells them, you must get rid of all, uh, destroy all the uh, statues of the Baal and Asherah and turn back to the Lord. And they do. And they win the, the battle. And it's at this point that uh, these verses where he said, the Lord is, has... Um, has protected us basically to this point. I got all this information out of uh, the Deacon Bible commentary, and the commentator is a guy named, a man named uh, Clyde Riddle. And in that commentary, he, can, uh, he states what he considers the purposes of the book of Judges, and there's three of them. And the first consideration is, it shows the need for a consecrated leader. While Joshua was, was still alive, the people served the Lord. While Samuel was alive, the people served the Lord again. And it's interesting, the very next chapter, chapter 8, is the chapter where the people demand a king. And they again reject the Lord, and it just stay, it starts that cycle over again, over, over and over again. Because they say there was no man, there was no king in Israel. And every man did what was right in his own sight. And without proper leadership, the result is civil confusion and moral chaos. Two judges emphasizes the patience of God. I'm so glad for God's patience, for his protection. 
there was a time in my life, and I call it my prodigal period, for 10 years, from 1966 to 1976, I was the prodigal son. And prodigal means reckless or wasteful. That's the definition of prodigal. And that's a real good dis description of how I was living until 1976. But during that time, God, God's hand of protection was on me. And I got three uh, events that took place to show that. <clears throat> In uh, 1968, we moved back from Kellogg to Sandpoint again. And my dad went to work with a, a friend of his who was a barber in town. My dad was a barber. But that friend, his name was Gideon Hines. Everybody called him Dutch Hines. But he owned that property from where the, the road, Star Road by Home Depot, from that road clear to the intersection of the highway of Kootenai Cutoff and uh, Highway 200. He owned all that land out there. There's a road there, it's called McNerney Road. Well, it's called that because there was about a one acre piece of ground that owned, was owned by the McNerneys. He owned everything else out there. But uh, I went to work for him bucking bales. Picking bales off the ground and putting them on a trailer. And uh, my cousin and I, my cousin David, and I had loaded a trailer up. It was a four-wheel trailer. We put 75 bales of hay on it, green bales. They weighed about 80 or 90 pounds a piece. So it was about three tons of hay. But uh, the guy that was pulling the trailer had a Jeep pickup with a flatbed on it, and he's pulling the trailer with a flatbed. And he wanted to, wanted to load the flatbed up as well. I said, man, somebody fall off that, that flatbed, they'll, they'll run over them. Oh no, that'll never happen. So I'm up on the flatbed stacking, stacking the bales, and my cousin David is throwing the bales up to me. And we're about halfway loaded on the truck. They're about four bales high. I had a bale right about here, and he took off, pitched me right off the back of the, of the truck. Broke my arm, both bones and two places, and then right, ran right across my chest. Right across here. I had a blood blister with tire tread across my chest. So my cousin rushes me to the hospital after he stopped the guy from running over me with a back tire. He rushed me to the hospital. He took x-rays and, and uh, I didn't have a broken bone, no internal bleeding, nothing. But God protected me. That's the first time. There have been many times, but that's the first time. The second time, during my uh, wild period, uh, Steve, David's brother, and I were boozers, bad. We were alcoholics. And we'd driven to Knox in Montana, because Steve wasn't old enough to drink in Idaho, but he was in Montana at the time. So we. We took his father's 64 station wagon, Ford station wagon, to Montana. And we heard that there was a dance going to go on in, in Heron, Montana, which is about 12 miles away. Well, so we took the back road because we were afraid we'd get caught by the state cops if we took the main highway. So we took the back road. And uh, Steve took off, and he was doing about 80 miles an hour. And as soon as he got off the pavement on the dirt, dirt road, he lost control, snapped two trees off, and then went over a 170-foot embankment that was just about like that. But nothing but rocks, and big rocks, big as a house. And we bounced all the way to the bottom of that. And the uh, car finally came to a stop between two rocks. And I heard a voice say, get out of the car, get up to the road. Okay, so we did. And uh, I asked Steve, what you, why, why'd you tell me to get out of the car? He said, I didn't say a word. About that time, uh, uh, a car came, and it was the uh, county sheriff. And he heard us take off, and he knew we were going to wreck, so he came and uh, 
stopped us. I never forget his name. His name was Shorty Mercer. He was six foot eight and 350 pounds. So, but he took us into the hospital in Sandpoint and uh, then took us home. And I got a, a cut on my arm and a scratch on my head. And Steve had a, some scratches in his arm. And that car, the station wagon, was literally meshed. Uh, the, the top was pushed clear down to the seat all the way except over our head. I mean, both got out with these scratches. God protected me. And the third time, I was working right up here on Katka before they had the road into Boulder Creek. I was on the crew that helped put that road in. And my, uh, my uncle had got the contract to haul the logs uh, off that they had to fall a bunch of timber to pioneer the road in. It was all a great big tamarack, three and four foot on the stump, and 100 feet tall. They were huge. Well, they had a logging company cutting, but we were going to haul the logs. But every now and then they'd have a log in the deck that wasn't cut. It was still tree length, and it was my job to cut them up. So we went to the first deck there, and sure enough, there's a tree length in the deck. And it was laying across the deck like that, and I knew it had a bind in it. So, so I crawled down underneath the deck, and I saw way on it with a chainsaw there and put a pretty good undercut in it, and I went back up and to make the top cut on it, and I was standing on it, and I had a brand new pair of cork boots on. I touched the top of that, that tree with the saw, and it popped, and it pitched me into the air. I mean, 15 feet, saw went that way, and I went that way, right down over the bank, right underneath that log as it was rolling down the hill. And it would have mashed me flat, except there was a log laying up the deck. Roll right down that log. It was about that far from me, but never touched me. God protects me. That reminded me of uh, a man named Elmer Smelzenbaugh. He was the first Nazarene missionary in Swaziland, South Africa. And Vicki and I went to uh, a family camp at uh, Pine Low Campground, north of Spokane. And he was a guest speaker there. And he wasn't really a preacher, he just told stories, a lot of stories. Um, but he told the story, uh, how God had protected him. And he always said, and God, and my friend was there. Well, he was going to a, a remote village to, to talk to a friend of his, or a, one of the native people that was sick, and he was gonna go see if he could help. But he had to pass through a, a, a real heavy jungle at the time. And he said he was walking along and he smelled a snake. I never smelled a snake. I don't have any idea what the, but we don't have snakes here that are as big as your arm and 15 feet long either. And he said he stopped and his son was right behind him like that. He said he looked around like that, didn't want to move his head, but he just looking around with his eyes like that trying to see where it was, and uh, all of a sudden he looked uh, right in front of him, a thing that he thought was a, a small tree or a vine or something. There's a black mamba right here in front of him. And they are deadly, they are vicious. And uh, he said he thought, well, I'll grab it by the neck there and hold on and, and Harmon, my son, can get away. And he said, where's the Where's the neck on a snake? So, oh Lord, what am I going to do? And he said, he said, my friend was there. That snake went like that and slid off. Protection. He told of all all kinds of stories like that. God not only protects us, he provides for us.
Matthew 6, 28 says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they, need, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in his glory has not been arrayed like one of these. For 45 years, Vicki and I have seen time and time and time again God's um, provision in our lives. In 1979, July 12th, we set out to get married. We were, I was living in Kellogg, and Vicki was living east of Kellogg in a little uh, community called Sunny Slope. And I had one day off of work. I was working in a, in a warehouse market. So we decided we'd go to Coeur d'Alene to get married. So we jumped in my pickup. We took off towards Coeur d'Alene, about six miles from Coeur d'Alene. I threw a rod in the truck there. And we, <laughs> and we stopped. About five minutes later, Vicky's good friend from Sunny Slope come driving up. He said, what are you guys doing? <laughs> so we're going to get married. So she drove us into town, dropped us off at the courthouse where we get the marriage license, and we had to take blood tests. And while the tests were developing, Vicky and I walked up uh, probably a mile up to a, a little mall there to get a ring. Then back down to the hitching post in Coeur d'Alene. And Dr. Reverend Green married us there at the hitching post. He was the pastor of the Four Square Church in Coeur d'Alene. Then Tanny came and, and brought us home. So God provided for her there. We were uh, in college. Uh, I was in college in Moscow. And Vicky had to have a tooth fixed. And the doctor said, you're going to need a crown. Well, we didn't have money. 500 bucks for a crown at that time. And, uh, and Vicki asked the doctor, can we pray about it before, you know, make a decision? So we did. And we, we said, well, the Lord will provide. And I believe we went home and there was a check in the mail for the amount. Where it came from, I don't remember, but uh, God pr provide. We were driving to Alaska. When I was working up there, we decided to move to uh, the Kenai Peninsula. And it took us six days, because I was the only one driving, pulling a trailer. And we were going from Watson Lake in British Columbia to, to um, not Watson Lake, but Fort Nelson in British Columbia to, to Watson Lake in the Yukon Territory. It was about 400 miles between them. And we were going along pretty good, but we were about 50 miles outside of Watson Lake, and all of a sudden the, the car almost jerks to a stop, and I see smoke just rolling out from behind it, big cloud of smoke. And I thought, oh man, I blew the engine or the transmission. But I was sitting there and the engine just, but, 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 it wasn't the engine. So I got out and I looked and it wasn't the truck, it was the trailer. What had happened is there's two straps that hold the frame of to the, axle, the spring to the frame in a trailer. And those two snapped and the axle had shifted back and the tire was rubbing on the inside of the fender. And it, just, it got hot and it was just smoke rolling out of there. Uh oh, about that time, a guy in a pickup came up behind us and said, uh, are you all right? And I said, well, my axle shifted. I said, but I think I can, I can pull it back into place with the come along. So I did. I pulled it back into place. And we're 50 miles from Watson Lake and there's nothing in between us and Watson Lake. But the guy said, I'll follow you into Watson Lake, make sure you make it. I said, I'm only going to have um, I can only go about 30 miles an hour. He said, that's all right. And uh, he followed us all the way into Watson Lake. We got there. He smiled, waved like that, big smile. <laughs> Went by. God provides. 
that reminded me of this of uh, smells and bog again. Uh, his wife was a, a nurse, a medical missionary, and she worked in all the, the villages uh, delivering babies and whatnot, and worked so so hard, she actually enlarged her heart and had, uh, had a heart attack, and a massive heart attack, and they rushed her to the hospital, and uh, the doctor said, there's no chance that this woman's gonna survive. She won't, you know, she probably won't survive the night. But uh, she did, and she, but she was in a coma, and Smelzenbaugh was sitting by her side, and he said he couldn't, he couldn't leave her side, you know, because any minute she was liable to die. But he got to the point where he was so tired he had to go lay down, and, uh, and the, her doctor, came in and said, well, I'll watch her and go lay down. And he said, as soon as that smells of ball left, he was sitting there, he's thinking, this lady won't be with us much longer. She's heavy breathing and raspy breathing. He said, he looked at her and her eyes popped open. He, looked. he said, how do you feel? She said, I'm thirsty. So he went and got her a drink of water came back, he's stunned. He said, how do you feel? She said, if I had my glasses, I could see better. 100% healed. Top it off, though. She's been in the hospital for, I think he said a week or something like that. Well, racking up a pretty good uh, hospital bill. So he said, well, I'll go down to see if I can't make payments. So we walked into the administrator's office and, and, uh, and said, is it possible that I can make payments and pay off my wife's bills? And the administrator said, no, you don't owe us anything. He said, your church has paid the bill in full. And at that time, uh, his wife was still at home alive and doing fine. So. That day was uh, one of the most uh, fantastic experiences I've ever had. They played the song, Come Thou Fount, and everybody was singing. And as they were singing, the spirit came. Just mighty, mighty way. Just unbelievable. The presence of God. There were people, people going down the altar, just one after another. And, uh, and people coming to know God in a special way. A man stood up and testified. He said he'd been raised in the Nazarene church and heard about the filling of the Spirit and sanctification all his life. He, he never really believed it. thought it was nothing but emotionalism until that day. If we can have that same, same feeling today, that God is ever bit as present now as he was those 40 years ago. And, uh, that's my prayer. That's always been my prayer. That God will, there will be another mighty movement of the Holy Spirit in this country. Because we definitely need it. And pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that I can come and, and deliver this message. And thank you for your help, Lord. Helping me to get through it. You are a mighty God. You are our Savior. You are our Lord. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.